We're in part two of our series entitled Attitude Adjustment, and it's great to have you back with us today as we dive into this uh, part two of our, of our series of how having a focus on Christ can change our attitude. And what I want to do is look at chapter two. If you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there this morning and let Paul describe for us how we can have a new and different way of thinking. Let me do a quick, quick review before we get started. If you missed last week, Philippians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church at, at Philippi, which was a church that Paul himself had started in about the year 52 AD. There is strong evidence that this was probably his most loved church. Now, we say that based on the knowledge that we have, because we certainly don't know all the churches that Paul planted down through his many missionary journeys through the years. But with the evidence that we have in Scripture, there's no doubt that he had a very strong emotional attachment with the church at Philippi. And we see this genuine affection in the words of Paul as we read through this epistle we call Philippians. Apparently, Paul had gone through a time of great need and great difficulty. And the people in the church of Philippi, not exactly sure what it was, but they sent a gift. They, they sent uh, uh, something that helped Paul out through a very difficult time in his life. Then as Paul found himself under house arrest for preaching the gospel, he writes this epistle that we know as Philippians. He writes this epistle to the church at Philippi as really a, a thank you letter for all that they had done for him. Now, last week I told you that an unmistakable theme of the epistle of Philippians is the theme of joy. And there is no doubt that that is the case. But if you read carefully through the verses of this book, all four chapters, in fact, if you read carefully, you will see something else mentioned over and over and over again. And that is the mind. In fact, in this epistle that we call Philippians, 16 different times, Paul mentions the mind, different references to the mind. And, there, and, and I think it makes sense to us as we think about the book of joy that Philippians is, that if you don't have the right mindset, if you don't have the right attitude, it's going to be very difficult to maintain the right kind of joy in your spirit. So we're going to talk about that this morning and what our attitude should be like if our mind is right. So Philippians chapter 2, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn there with me this morning. Let's dive in to verses 1 and 2. And I'm just going to warn you, this is a power-packed chapter. And really, to do it justice, I should probably spend a couple of weeks on it. But you've got a couple of hours this morning, right? There's nothing important happening at 1 o'clock this afternoon, I know. Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my, what? Make my joy complete by being like-minded. Here's our first reference to joy, first reference to the mind, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Now, as we talked about last week, there was apparently in the church at Philippi just a little bit of division going on in the church, and so that tells us right up front that it is a normal church, right? Because there's, there's always perhaps just a little bit of division in the church. And so Paul took the opportunity when writing this letter to kind of encourage them, hey guys, get over it. You're better than this. You know better than this. And he speaks to them gently, but the message is really clear. There's no doubt he's making a point. Listen, friends, I need you to be like-minded, to put yourselves together on similar things. And he's, and he's basically pointing to the fact that everything that he has said in chapter 1, everything that he's going to say in the following chapters, be like-minded on these things. I think sometimes we need to be reminded. We are different, aren't we? We have different opinions, different points of view. Listen, our life stories have all brought us to this point in a different way. 
That does not mean that we are divided. Because we are united through the blood of Jesus Christ and there is more that unites us than divides us. Can I hear an amen? Amen. 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 Now, why is this such a big deal? It's a big deal because how we think matters. Our thoughts matter. And if you look through Scripture, there's just a ton of very powerful verses about the importance of our thoughts, about the state of our mind. Let me just rattle off a few of those to you. And I know you're looking at your notes this morning on your bulletin and saying, we really are going to be here for two hours. <laughs> James 1.8 says that a double-minded man is unstable in all he does. Talks about the mind. Romans 12.2, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, his perfect will. Paul told the Corinthians in chapter 10, verse 5, to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. It's a, it's a lesson of the mind. Paul told the Philippians, we'll talk about it in week 4, in chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is right, whatever is lovely and admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, he said, think on these things. I love Proverbs 23, verse 7. I particularly like it out of the King James Version where it says, as a man thinks. I think the word is, as a man thinketh, so is he. What goes on here becomes who we are. That's why our thoughts are so important. Today I want to pull out several principles of Philippians chapter 2 that I, I hope will change our attitudes today, mine included, and develop a new, improved way of thinking. Here's number one if you're taking notes. How you think determines what you become. How you think. This is why this is important. Because I can basically, I think we can basically tell what somebody's going to be like based on how they think. How you think determines what you become. If you have negative thoughts, you're going to become a negative person. If you constantly focus on the negative in other people, you're going to be negative toward other people. You're going to be hurtful toward other people. You're going to be unkind. You're going to be impatient. You might just be lonely because people don't want to be around somebody that's always negative about them. And I can tell you for sure, you will live a miserable life if you focus on the negative. How you think determines what you become. Listen, the success of nearly Every battle we face, and I don't overstate that, nearly every battle we face, it hinges on the health and the Christ-likeness of our thought patterns. How we respond to tragedy, how we respond to difficulties. And as we're talking about in this series, it's all about our attitude. And here's the key. If you can discipline your mind to think like Christ thinks, you'll have a great outlook. You'll have a great attitude and be able to accomplish incredible things that God is going to call you to do. Now, for Paul, we see this as an example and a great example. Everything was about Jesus. Now, I'm not saying Paul was perfect. He, he clearly wasn't. He wasn't God. But as you look at his ministry, as you look at his writings, everything was about Jesus. Last week, we looked at a at a verse where Paul said, Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, for me to live is Christ. And then he goes on, and to die is gain. What is he saying? Hey, stop thinking like the world thinks. Stop thinking how, how the culture thinks. You, you cannot maintain a transformed mind if you're inundated by the things of this world. How many times have we heard it? Trash in, trash out. If we allow trash in here, it's going to go into here. It's going to come out. And listen, there is not much in this world that is worth really paying much attention to. So much of what we see, so much of what we're exposed to, if we are inundated in the culture, if we are feeding on the culture, oh, we'll have a transformed mind all right, but it won't be Christ-like. 
Stop thinking about yourself, Paul says. What you need to do is begin thinking like Christ. In fact, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16, it says we are literally to have the mind of Christ. Now, that's a call, to have the mind of Christ. You say, Pastor, how do I do that? Well, I'll tell you one thing. In your human nature, in your natural self, you cannot do that. This is why in the Church of the Nazarene, we believe in the empowering, infilling of the Holy Spirit. We call that entire sanctification, where you are filled with His Spirit through a complete complete commitment to Him, and His Spirit fills us to the point that our mind is transformed, and we are empowered to live a Christ-like life. Listen, you cannot do that in your own strength. He introduces a new way of thinking. It all starts with the mind. What are you putting in your mind? Listen, if you're putting five hours of Netflix in your mind every day, if you're putting three hours of social media in your mind every day, if you're watching the news all day, God help you. God help you you're not becoming more like Jesus. Especially when your Bible's dusty and your prayer life is non-existent. It's no wonder you're not being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Church, this is so important. If you begin to think like Jesus thought, you'll begin to live like Jesus lived. Man, I didn't get an amen in the first service either the first time. I think that's pretty good. If you begin to think like Jesus thought, you'll begin to live like Jesus lived. And that's what we want. If you think like he thought, empowered by the Spirit of God, you will become more like him. Christ. Likeness, is that not our goal? Is our goal just to kind of skimp along with the least amount of spiritual help that we can get? Or is our goal to become like Christ, to fall in love, in passionate love with Christ, so that we begin to represent him to a world that is lost and dying? So how did Jesus think? Well, if you look at what he taught and the way he lived, it's obvious that he thought about pleasing God, number one. Pleasing God and loving people. Those were his priorities. In fact, when asked, what is the most important commandment? You remember this, this, this conversation. He said in Luke 10, 27, that it's what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, notice there, it does not say you cannot love yourself. You just got to love others as much as you love yourself. And if we do that, we'll be just fine. Amen? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, to love your neighbor as yourself. His life was about pleasing God, number one, and loving people, number two. Now, in Philippians, we see Paul teaching. He was teaching this very same principle. And here's the way Paul taught this, Philippians 2, verse 3. He says, do nothing out of selfish selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in what? But in humility, consider others better than yourself. Now, the Greek word translated as humility literally means modesty. Modesty. It means a humility of the mind or a lowliness of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility of the mind. In other words, I choose in my mind to position myself lower than others to please God and to love other people. I'm going to do some marriage counseling this morning. Can I do that for just a second? If you want to have a healthy, happy marriage, you've got to take this humility of mind thing to heart. I tell you, I've counseled, I've counseled a lot of people down through the years, and when you've got two people thinking about themselves, you've got a disaster. You've got a train wreck. You want to have a healthy, happy marriage? You have a humility of the mind. You want to have a healthy, happy family? 
You have a family with the humility of the mind. You want to have a healthy, happy church? You have a humility of the mind. You want to have a healthy, happy world? Is it too much to pray for? It would be a whole lot better if we had a humility of the mind. Look at verse 4. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Then he says, what in verse 5? Your attitude, here we go, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. You ever wondered what an attitude is? An attitude is a, a little thing that makes a massive difference. It's, it's a little thing that can literally change the trajectory of your life. If you get your attitude right, your life is going to be changed. It's going to be different. And I'll be the first to say that a lot of, a lot of good things can come by just having a positive attitude. Do you, do you know somebody that has a positive attitude? I mean, did you know that you don't have to be a believer to have a positive attitude? I, I know non-Christians who have a positive attitude and, hey, they're fun to be around because they got a positive attitude. It's kind of like the little kid who stood in his backyard. He loved baseball, and uh, he, was, uh, he was kind of practicing, and, and he said, I am the greatest hitter who has ever lived. And he threw the ball up in the air, and he took a swing, and he missed it. And so he picked up the ball, and he said again, I am the greatest hitter who has ever lived. And he threw the ball up in the air, and he swung at it, and he missed it. Once again, he said, I am the greatest batter of all time. And he threw the ball up and he swung the bat and he missed it again. And he said, wow, I'm also the greatest pitcher who has ever lived because I just struck out the greatest batter of all time. You know what that is? That's a good attitude. Let me say it again. Attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. Now, what is your attitude? What is your attitude? Very simply, I would say that your attitude is your mental habit. Your mental habit. That's what it is. Did you know that you have a habit of thought? Unless you intentionally change it, you will stay in that habit of thought. It's, it, it's just the way that you've trained your brain to think. And, and what do we know about habits? Well, we know that habits are acquired. In other words, you can create habits. Well, we know that, right? You can create habits. You can create good habits. You can create bad habits. You can create good habits of thought. You can create bad habits of thought. Listen, an, an action repeated becomes a habit formed. And this definitely applies to the way we think. That's why, again, back to Romans 12 too. Romans 12 too says, do not conform to the patterns of this world. Because that's brokenness. That's misery. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind to create Christ-like habits in your mind. And again, this won't happen if you're watching Netflix five hours a day. I'm, I'm not going to want to pick on Netflix, but some of us do. Some of us are on social media all day. That is not creating good mental habits. Nobody gets more godly by being on social media three hours a day. I mean, I suppose you could see yourself as a social media missionary I don't know that I've ever seen one that's very good at it. Notice this. Positive thinking isn't enough. No offense to Norman Vincent Peale. Paul didn't tell us we just need to have a positive attitude. That's helpful. That's important. We should have a positive attitude, but that's not enough. Paul takes it up a notch. He challenges us. You need not only a positive attitude, you need a Christ-like attitude. Look at verse 5 again. Here's exactly what he said. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And what did that attitude lead him to do? Look at verse 6. 
who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, something to be grasped, a lot of your translations say. That leads us to the second principle in, in, this, in this new way of thinking. In the kingdom of God, write this down, pleasing God isn't about self-promotion, but self-abandonment. Does that ring a bell? I have been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live, but he lives in me. Let's break it down. Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, something to be used to his own advantage. Now, if you think about it, that's exactly, think about this, that's exactly what Lucifer and his minions did before they were thrown out of heaven. You remember the story in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. I'm not going to read them today. But five different times in those three verses, Satan says, I will be like God. I will arise. I will ascend. I will be like him. Remember in the garden when the serpent came, how did he tempt Adam and Eve? You can be like God. But Jesus taught, Philippians 2, 6, equality with God is not something to be grasped. Following Christ is not about self-promotion. It's about self-abandonment. Over and over in Scripture, we are challenged to lose our lives so that in Christ we might find it. The text goes on to say in verse 7 that he did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but Jesus made himself nothing. You ever thought about that? Jesus, who had every right, who was with God, who is God in in the splendor and the glory of heaven, Jesus stripped himself of everything to become a servant to those who sinned against him. He was the one who had every right to be praised. And yet what did he do? He knelt before sinful men and he took a basin of water and a towel and he washed the feet of the lowest of the low. Paul says, he made himself nothing. Now listen, keep that thought in mind. When God created the world, what did God create the world out of? Nothing. He created the world out of nothing. So here's the deal. Listen carefully. That's important. As long as you are nothing, God can make something out of you. You're awfully quiet this morning. As long as you are nothing, God can make something out of you. But when you start thinking of yourself as something, that's when you're at risk at not fulfilling God's divine plan for you. Did you know that? God can do nothing with people who are full of themselves. Romans 12, 3, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. But once you realize you are nothing, Once I realize I am nothing, watch him work. Watch him work. Jesus made himself nothing. And look how the kingdom of God grew. It's not about self-promotion. It's about self-abandonment. It's about me saying, my life is not my own. I have been purchased. I have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. My life is no longer about me. My life is all about him. Back to verse 7. It says that Jesus made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. Last week in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, I'm not sure if you noticed this. If you're in my Wednesday night Bible study, you know that I can never stay in the text we're studying. We go all over the place, right? I'm going to do that again this morning, all right? Philippians, go back to last week, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. I want you to see something here. Philippians 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus.
Does that seem different to you than other epistles Paul wrote? If you know your scriptures well, you would say, yeah, that's a little different. Notice how Paul introduced himself to the people in Philippi in the letter. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. This is one of the few epistles where he did not introduce himself as an apostle. He usually says, Paul, an apostle. And then he goes on to list his credentials. In nearly every other epistle, Paul the apostle, here's my credentials. Paul the apostle, here's my credentials. But here... It's different. Because of his relationship with the Philippians, he says, you know what? Paul, and I'll use the Greek word, a doulos, a servant. In other words, he says, I kneel down. I am here to serve God, and I am here to serve you. In fact, the way that word doulos is translated, it literally means one who is permanently devoted to do the will of another. Jesus made himself nothing so he could become a doulos, so that he could become permanently devoted to do the will of the one who sent him. And that's a new way of thinking. And church, that's the way we should be thinking. Jesus made himself nothing. That should be our attitude. It's not about, hey, look at me. Hey, look at how good I am. Look at how successful I am. But it's about self-abandonment. I lose my life so I can find it in Jesus. If you're taking notes, here's the third principle in this new way of thinking. Serving. Serving is not what I do. A servant is who I am. Now, admittedly, this is hard. This is not how we naturally think. This is why we need the supernatural Holy Spirit working in us, because this is not our natural way of thinking. Our natural tendency is to be served, to want to be served. You say, oh, that's not necessarily true. Ah, it is. I can assure you it is. Our natural tendency is to want to be served. Uh, It's a different way of looking at things and, 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 and thinking about things that would lead us to a different outlook, a different attitude in life. Let me give you an example this morning. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna try to prove it to you. We like to be served. Many of you walked in this building this morning. And completely took for granted, there were people standing ready to serve you. From the parking lot attendant, to the greeter at the door, to the children's workers in the back, to the greeter at these doors handing you a bulletin, to the coffee and donuts provided in the lobby, to the musicians who stand before you and lead you in worship. In fact, Some of you came in and so took it for granted, at least in your mind, you probably complained about something. You know why I know that? Because I hear it all the time. You see, humans in our our natural selves, we want to be served. Even when we come to church, where we are reminded we are not to be here to be served, but to be servants, we complain about how we're served. We need a new way of thinking. We need a transformed mind. Let me ask you, who have you served today? This week? This month? Listen, I told the early service, I told them one thing that I had to quickly take it back because I realized it was wrong. Because I said, I'll tell you the mistake I made. I said, you don't have to serve anybody here. You, and then I thought, oh, well, well, that's stupid. Every one of us ought to be serving here. 
Now, I realize we might have newcomers in this place, and we welcome you, and we want you to feel at home. Let us serve you today. But listen, if you're a regular attender, if this is your church, you should walk into this place every Sunday and look for somebody to serve. We ought to be serving each other because that's how the Bible describes the body of Christ. Can I say that? We never walk in here to be served. We walk in here. Look for somebody that you can encourage, somebody you don't know you can talk to, somebody that's new you can welcome them, somebody that looks like they're sad. You go over and put your hand on their shoulder. Brother, can I help you? Can I pray with you? We don't come here to be served. We come here to serve. And even beyond that, this is where my point was right, but it was wrong. We go out of here. We're doing the same thing with the world. Who can I serve? Where can I serve? You see, when we start to see ourselves not just as a servant, something we do, but who we are, thinking and living like Jesus just becomes a reflection of who I am. It's, it's not a show. We don't do it for obligation. It's not a job we have to do. We, we check it off. It's a reflection of how we think because our minds have been transformed. We live like Jesus. It's a new way of thinking. I don't go to church because I have to serve. No, I serve because I'm a follower of Christ. When someone's in need, we just immediately and instinctively react because it's an overflow of who I am. Serving is not just something I do, but because I belong to Christ and I've been transformed by his grace, a servant is who I am. It is my identity. And can I just say something? I know I'm kind of coming across kind of, kind of strong this morning. Pastor was kind of strong this morning. We have a lot of great servants in this church. Can I just say that? Some of the most loving, giving, selfless people I have ever known. And I just want to affirm that. Some of you have taken on the mindset of Christ, and you are showing him, and I am proud of you. And I'm proud, I'm proud to stand side by side with you for the kingdom. Because that's who we're called to be. I have completely lost where I am this morning. <laughs> Jesus said, I didn't come to be served by others. He said, I came to serve. I am a servant. And how did he serve? Oh, we, we got to get back to Philippians 2. I didn't forget here we go. Pick it up in verse 8. I told you this was good. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. One of the most powerful passages in all of Scripture. This is what Jesus did. He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but, but he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. He was totally devoted to do the will of his Father. Now, I want you to think about this. I'm going to read some of the more well-known verses from Paul's writings, mostly Philippians. And I want you to ask yourself, how could Paul say this stuff, being chained 24 hours a day to a Roman soldier's, awaiting a trial that could end up in his execution? How could he say stuff like this? Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Acts 20, 24, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may do the will of God. How could he say that? Philippians 3, 8, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. How could he say that while under arrest on death row? Philippians 4, 6, and 7, oh, do not be anxious about anything. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. How could he say that? The answer? You can only say that if you think like Jesus thought. 
You live like Jesus lived. It's a new way of thinking. It's not about me. It's about him. Serving is not something I do. Serving is who I am. Pleasing God isn't about self-promotion, but about self-abandonment. Last principle, number four, if you're taking notes. My joy is not based on what happens to me, but what God is doing in me and through me. It's a new way of thinking. It's a changed attitude. My joy is not based on what happens to me, but what Christ is doing in me and through me. Look, last week we looked at uh, Philippians 1 verse 12, where Paul made this amazing statement. Everybody's worried about him. Everybody's concerned because he's in prison. They don't know how he's holding up. And, And remember what Paul said. He says, but what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. You see, it's not what happens to me, but it's what God is doing in me and through me. So many of us, we let our circumstances drive our attitudes. Guilty, raise your hand. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Yeah, we let our circumstances drive our attitudes. I do it. We let our circumstances define us. Too many times. And one day we're up and one day we're down. Inconsistent. Moody. Can I just, some of us, we have spiritual schizophrenia. Why? Because we let happen on the, we, what happens on the outside, we, we let define the inside, our minds. But not Paul. And that's why in the middle of house arrest in a Roman prison, Paul could write such a beautiful letter. And he can can even say, look at verse 17. He can even say, but even... You you see, Paul's a realist. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad. I can't believe he says this next part. And rejoice with all of you. Paul says, I'm glad. How could he say, I'm glad? Because he he knew something. He learned something. It wasn't about him. Never was about him. It's always been about him. Ever since that moment on the road to Damascus where he saw that light from heaven and the word of the Lord spoke to him, he knew he was never the same. If I think like Jesus thought, I can live like Jesus lived. Serving is not what I do. A servant is who I am. It's all about him. You know, I wasn't going to read verse 17, but my heart was checked. Did you see verse 17? Actually, it's verse 18. After he makes this profound statement, he says, so you too. This is Paul. Despite what's happened to me, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. What a testimony. What an attitude. I don't know about you, but I feel like I got a lot of work to do in making my attitude more like him. As I mentioned a little earlier about entire sanctification, yeah, there is a moment when we make that surrender, that commitment to him, but can I tell you something? That that grows with us the rest of our life. 
That process continues in your heart and your life as long as he gives you breath. We continue to grow to be more like Christ. Because pleasing God isn't about self-promotion but self-abandonment. I lose my life to find it. And therefore, my joy isn't based on what anybody does to me or anybody says to me or what happens to me. It's based on who he is and what he's doing in me and through me. And so Paul says, listen, you can lock me up, throw away the key. You can kill me if you want. But up until my last breath, I won't shut up. I won't stop. You can't steal my joy. Why? Because I've had an attitude adjustment. And that happened when I learned to think like Jesus thinks. And church, that's my prayer for us. Would you stand with me? Father, what a marvelous message. Not because of the eloquence of a preacher, but because your word is so powerful. The words of Paul cut right to the heart of where so many of us struggle. It's our mind. It's the powers of our mind. And Lord, I am not here to condemn. I am not here to point fingers. But I am here to say I I relate to this struggle. I relate to the messages of this world that that oftentimes in too many ways control my thinking, control my thoughts. And I would imagine this morning across this room, there there are people who would agree that there's the struggle in their own minds. Too much junk in, too much influence causes too much junk out. And so, Lord, I'm asking you to help us. Lord, I'm, I'm asking that we lean into that promise not conforming to the pattern of this world, but being transformed. God, I cannot do that myself. But I am so thankful that you have sent your Holy Spirit. Lord, that we can step into that sanctification. We can step into to that transforming work of the Holy Spirit. We say, Lord Jesus, I give it all to you. I want to be like Jesus. And so take every part of my life, take every part of my mind, Conform it to your will, to your way. Lord, help us to feed on the things of your word, to feed on the things of Jesus, to fill our hearts with your will, to fill our hearts with your truth, and then may we represent you in that transformed life, in that transformed mind. May we represent Christ to a world that desperately needs to see him through us. Oh God, we pray this. We pray this, God, for us all. Make our attitudes that of Jesus. And as we're dismissed this morning, let me say this blessing over you. Out of the book of Romans, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. To him be glory and honor and power forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. 